No, no. Sit down, Billy. I'll tell you something. Here, take one of these. He's thrust over the dented yellow tin cigarettes in it. There's the fossil record of life. Going back billions of years, it's got to be full of gaps, full of arguments about how evolution happened. So they use those to say it didn't happen at all. We have the questions and they have the answers. Dressing up Genesis and calling it science, they go back from Malachi, counting up all those begats, 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 and the creation took place October 26, 4004 BC at 9 a.m. That's what they call scientific method. Did anybody see it? No, no, it's revealed right there in the first couple of pages of Genesis. That's what you call revealed wisdom. Talk about having business with the Bible. You walk down the street in Smackover and somebody you've never seen in your life comes right up and asks you if you've been saved as if it's any of his damn business. And he thinks it is. The prevailing IQ in this country is about 100. Did you know that? Good God. Talk about a dark continent. I'll tell you something. Revelation's the last refuge ignorance finds from reason. Revealed truth is the one weapon stupidity's got against intelligence, and that's what the whole damn thing is about. The glass came up, emptied, and he looked up. She'd come right in this time, holding out these trash bags you asked for, and then... Billy? Where he was struggling upright from the magazine bundle. Mr. McCandless has a lot to do here. He's... I don't think you should take any more of his... Right, right, I'm coming. I, no, 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 it's all right, Mrs. Booth. Your brother just wanted to know about this trial in Smackover, and that's what the whole damn thing was all about, academic freedom to teach this rickety scientific creationism, and the judge saw right through it, and we won the case. Talk about a healthy attitude. We won the case, and they won their equal time. Because the only healthy attitude was to teach neither one of them. Wait. He was sweeping together what he'd pulled from the trash bag. Sh show you what a judge in Georgia had to say. He dug among crumpled pages, news clippings. No, no, this one's better. Listen to this. Until textbooks are changed, there is no possibility that crime, violence, venereal disease, and abortion rates will decrease. This is a, a charming Texas couple who keep an eye out for school books that undermine patriotism, free enterprise, religion, parental authority. Nothing official, of course, just your good American vigilante spirit hunting down, where is it, uh, books that erode absolute values by asking questions to which they offer no firm answers. There, you see? Same damn thing. We've got the questions, and they've got the answers. Busy in there advising the state committee. There must be 20 of these states where local school boards can't buy textbooks that haven't been selected by the state committee. You think Texas wants one that talks about land redistribution in Central America or any place else? You think Mississippi wants one, a history book that tells the kids Nat Turner was anything but a coon show? You talk about censorship? And they howl like stuck pigs. No, they let the publishers do that for them. 65 million a year. That's what Texas spends on school books. That kind of money, the addition's so big it wipes out everything else. You'd think any publisher that wants to stay in business is going to try and peddle a $14 biology textbook to these primates with a chapter on their cousins back there banging around Lake Rudolph with their stone hammers. Finally repealed a law down there that evolution had to be taught as just another theory, not a fact. You think that'll make any difference? No, no, no. Stupidity's a damned hard habit to break. If it's not in the book, you can't teach it. Stupidity conquers ignorance, and they will all go home and read Reverend Ood's literature. Here, I'll show you something, Billy. Uh, no, well, I, I think may, maybe I better go and see if uh, uh, Bibbs. No, no, sit down. Sit down, look at this. Here's his survival handbook. Four pages, they call it a book. Keep handy for future reference, that's any minute. Now, when millions of Christians suddenly disappear from the face of the earth, and you're not one of them, they're all up there, meeting the Lord in the clouds, having a grand time, and you're left here with seven years of tribulation. But don't panic. Got your little handbook here. Tells you just what to do. Get ready for global war and global famine. Get out of the cities, they'll be destroyed. 
Stay away from mountains and islands, they'll be destroyed. Stay away from oceans, everything in them will be killed. Get in seven years' supply of food and water and get ready to fight off starving people and wild animals. Fix up your house to resist earthquakes and hundred-pound hailstones. And watch out for demon-controlled people and other creatures roaming around out there torturing and killing anybody in sight. Revelation 9, 1 to 18, it says it right here. God's word, isn't it? Revealed to St. John the Divine, just the way he revealed those three secrets to those kids at Fatima, same damn thing. Fire and pestilence, talk about being blown to kingdom come, that's exactly what they mean. And they can't wait. They can't wait to be snatched up, to meet the Lord in the clouds, and sit there watching the rest of us tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels. And the Lord right in there, rubbing his hands. They can't wait to see the sun darken, the stars fall, hailstones of fire, the cities crumbling, the seas turn to blood. i tell you something, Billy. The whole damn thing's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll tell you something right now. The greatest source of anger is fear. The greatest source of hatred is anger. And the greatest source of all of it is this mindless, revealed religion. Anywhere you look, Sikhs killing Hindus, Hindus killing Muslims, Druze killing Maronites. Jews killing Arabs, Arabs killing Christians, and Christians killing each other. <laughs> Maybe that's the one hope we've got. You take the self-hatred generated by original sin, turn it around on your neighbors, and maybe you've got enough sects slaughtering each other from Londonderry to Chandigarh to wipe out the whole damn thing here. Suddenly he was up. Give you something real to read if you want the whole story. Thrusting books aside in the bookshelf, because none of it is new. None of it is new. Uh, uh, no, no, but wait, ma'am. I'm not really... No, no, wait. Bibbs? And she might have come in. She got as far as the doorway again, standing there holding them a glare's length when the phone turned her back, where she'd come from, pushing aside the tea, still steeping in the cup, picking it up for, yes, hello, and then, oh, and, oh, and, but is everything... Oh, yes, I, I'll be here, yes. Where else would I... Yes, I'll be here holding it still before hanging it up, as though to give it time to reconsider, to retreat, retract, or at the least to offer some reprieve, but the only voice to be heard was the one raised through the doorway behind her. Talk about their deep religious convictions, and that's what they are. They're convicts, locked up in some shabby fiction, doing life without parole, and they want everybody else in prison with them. It's the smugness. That's stupidity's telltale. Billy, the damn self-righteous smugness here. Read this one. God and Jesus appear to a farm boy in upstate New York 150 years ago out in the woods where he's praying for guidance. 14 years old, he's guilty of sin that he can't understand. And just to make it worse, there's the resurrection and the life starting to bulge in his pants. So here comes the heavenly messenger, the resurrected angel who just happened to bury some plates on a nearby hill where 14 centuries before, with all the news, visions, revelations, prophecies, speaking with tongues, laying on of hands, he finally gets it all down in a book. That's one more recipe for bloodshed, and they're off. Bloodshed in Missouri, bloodshed in Norvo, Illinois, and this time it's his. Bloodshed across the Mississippi. Iowa, wait, wait, don't bother to read that one. No, 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 that's just a sideshow. Here's the real thing. Here's Runciman. 3,000 years of religious slaughter. Have you read Runciman? And so on, the uh, geologist turned uh, school teacher, McCandless, uh, uh, the author, William Gaddis's alter ego in this book, uh, ranting on about uh, one of the many aspects of scam world America uh, that are chronicled in all his books, and especially in the one I'm reading from, which is Carpenter's Gothic. Um, Really, uh, he's famous, Gaddis, for writing, for dialogue, non-stop dialogue, pouring across the book. But what is so marvelous and beautiful about uh, this great satirist, perhaps the greatest since Swift, is that given a chance to, uh, to, to, to pause and allow the book to actually contemplate uh, what lies before the characters who are really unable to pay any attention to it because they're obsessed with the scams uh, they're trying to bring or they're obsessed with being the innocents who are being scammed. But every so often the book, and Gaddis, uh, deploys this extraordinary descriptive 
uh, rapture, which is totally, uh, <laughs> it's just the most gorgeous companion to all the dialogue, the hilarious and hysterical dialogue in the book, quite unexpected and yet entirely belonging to Gaddis. A gutted chaise long, voluted in French pretension, trailing gold velvet in the dust undisturbed on the floor since she'd stood there maybe three or four times since she'd lived in the house. Looking down on the greens of the lower lawn and the leaves before they'd cried out their colours, before they'd seized separate identities here in vermilion haste gone withering red as old sores, there, bittersweet, paling yellow, towards stunted heights, glowing orange in that last spectral rapture, and to fall, reduced again to indistinction, in the stained monotony of lifelessness at her feet, where a dove carped among last testimonies, blown down from somewhere out of reach, out of sight, up the hill in its claim as a mountain, leaves of scarlet oak here and there, in the blackened red of blood, long clotted and, uh, and dried. Um, uh, an absolute master of poetic prose, a gaddis even though his chief preoccupation was people ranting on at each other uh, and not listening and and spilling over the borderlines which in fiction allowed us to figure out uh, who was speaking and when and when they moved uh, from the sofa to the chair or the kitchen to the lounge but they, you have to figure that out, you have to guess that, because they never stop talking, and the book is never allowed to say, and then he got up and went to the door, uh, because there's no time, uh, because we, uh, we modern people, and we Americans above all, are tumbling over each other uh, in our haste uh, to make money and to not lose a second, and uh, to... <laughs> continue whatever scams we're actually involved in in our desperate attempt uh, to make money to pay off our debts. Uh, debts in, in this particular book, in Carpenter's Gothic, uh, accrued from childhood, from birth, from uh, 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 Billy and Elizabeth's uh, gangster of a father who made a fortune but uh, uh, left it all in trust and it's been plundered by the lawyers, and there's virtually nothing left as desperately as Billy and Elizabeth try and prize some out. Uh, likewise, Paul, um, uh, Elizabeth's uh, thug of a husband. Um, and uh, so much time is spent so desperately trying uh, to make money to pay the bills that there is no time to establish that you are standing up uh, out of the armchair and go into the kitchen um, because the hurry is too great. And so the world that uh, Gaddis uh, presents to us encapsulates in what appears to be his uh, uh, postmodernist uh, experimentation is simply the world in which we can never catch our own breath to establish what it is that we're doing. Uh, we are so desperately the slaves of our schemes to get ourselves uh, out, of, uh, out of the red that we are the victims of our own, uh, our own plotting. And it, it, we, the reader, are carried uh, on, on this tsunami uh, of, uh, of utterances, of ranting, uh, past anything as ordinary and specific as uh, he went to the door. <laughs> and so you have to follow very carefully in, uh, in all of Gaddis's novels, particularly in Carpenter's Gothic, where fortun fortunately his uh, characters address each other by distinctive names. As a radio dramatist, Gaddis knew that what you have to do is allow, uh, if there are more than three characters uh, in any scene, allow the characters, when they address each other, to have a distinctive name for each other so you know uh, who's speaking, even though in radio drama uh, the, the timbre and the voice and the uh, gender identity of the voice may clarify it, as it doesn't on the page. Uh, Gaddis had learned well how to, how to trick out uh, this, the, the flood of conversation so that you could figure out from hints, uh, uh, inklings of uh, what it is that, uh, uh, who it is that's speaking. So uh, this wonderful, uh, ineffable, 
masterpiece uh, is, is, has come back, as it were, to haunt us. Uh, as he was writing it 40 years ago, uh, the America that he presented is the one that has come back most strongly, thanks to the Republican Party, uh, with its, its, its uh, creationism and its, its, its ruthless exploitation uh, of uh, the, the American populace uh, for money and this, this uh, tide of money in which we are all drowning. <laughs> it's none of it's ours. And yet, uh, uh, the, the tide that b belongs to other people is definitely drowning our voices. Not Gaddis's, thank God. Read and enjoy. And uh, thank you for listening to me for a moment.